Is that better? Oh, there we are. Oh, now I sound distinguished. Okay, it must be me. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit about Project Beta. Uh, and Beta stands for the best practices in the evaluation and treatment of agitated patients. Um, I was a, a, a president of an organization known as the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry uh, a few years back. And we decided at that time there was really not really good guidelines or, or, or any kind of a, a really cohesive approach to people who come in who are un unfortunately agitated at the time of their evaluation, be it in the emergency room, psychiatric hospital, even in the community, and thought that it was time to really put together some good patient-centric, trauma-informed guidelines on agitation that we would help to uh, spread around the country. So that's kind of the beginning of how this started, and, and uh, I'll kind of go from there and just, just move along uh, and talk about agitation in general. Um, agitation is what we would consider to be a behavioral emergency. Uh, one definition I really like uh, from a gentleman named Les Citrome uh, from Columbia is he calls it excessive verbal and or motor behavior. That's a nice little catchphrase because a lot of people, you'll talk to them, especially people who work in emergency settings, they'll say, I know agitation. Agitation is when somebody comes in and they're screaming and yelling and they throw three cops in every direction and they tear a bed out of the, the, the foundation and they're screaming and they're just like the Incredible Hulk. That's agitation. And yes, it is. That is agitation. But there's a much broader spectrum to agitation. Ag agitation is actually a huge spectrum that goes all the way up to that very logical extreme where we would call it like violent aggression down to somebody who's irritable, kind of restless. Maybe they're starting to kind of hit the wall or something a bit. They're starting to go, doctor, where's the doctor? And starting to say things in a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they can't really sit still. Maybe starting to do some purposeless movements and walking around and then starting to be demanding, things like that. So there's this big spectrum from Incredible Hulk on one side to somebody who's starting to get frustrated and irritable on the other. What we'd like to do is intervene much more when they're at that frustrated, irritable side. And because kind of when it gets to the point they're in their incredible hulk, it may be a little too late, and it would be nice to really prevent the bad outcomes that we see that, that happens with that. So what we would really call agitation, we see somebody who's kind of got what we call psychomotor activation, where they're, they're starting to get energized. They're starting to move around a bit. They're, they have a labile mood. They may be abusive verbally. Uh, they'll call the doctors and nurses lots of names and everything. They've been called lots of good names. Um, and, there's the, the, and the one thing that's most important then becomes the potential to harm themselves or harm others or, or harm property, where we see, for some reason, we've been seeing a lot of people throwing televisions through windows recently in our psych ED, which is very, very strange. Um, so, uh, seven million people may be having episodes of agitation that are treated in clinical settings each year right now in the United States. Now, that may be uh, in regular general me medical emergency departments, psychiatric inpatient units, or kind of like where I work, which is a dedicated psychiatric emergency department. Just real quickly, so that you know, I work in a standalone psychiatric emergency department that is compliant with EMTALA, so we're just like a general medical ED, except we're limited to psychiatric patients. But because Berkeley and Oakland uh, is a colorful community that may have a lot of, uh, of interesting different types of people living in it, we have a, a very busy psychiatric emergency department. And we are seeing anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 involuntary patients uh, per month where we work. And what we are able to do, though, is work with them intensively in the emergency department, and only 22% end up needing to be hospitalized. So all these people got brought in kind of like on police holds, uh, and in a lot of different situations, perhaps they would be put in restraints, they would be injected with medications that would make them unconscious, um, but instead we try to do some different alternatives and end up that only about uh, one in four, one out of five end up needing to be hospitalized because so many people can actually get better in less than 24 hours. Um, so that's a little bit different from where I work than, there's not too many dedicated psychiatric emergency departments that are kind of like where I work. There's just a, a really a handful, maybe a hundred in the United States that are like that. But just to give you a, a, a bit of an idea about that. Um, so this tells you a little bit more about my experience with agitated patients. So Alameda County is Berkeley, Oakland, um, there's a couple other big towns in there, uh, one and a half million residents. And we are the general uh, psychiatric emergency facility for adults uh, for that county of 1.5 million people and 800 square miles. 
Uh, as I said, 1,200 to 1,500 of people come to us on emergency psychiatric uh, holds. 90% of them are in emergency psychiatric holds. The rest come in and, and check themselves in. Uh, something like 20% or about 300 patients per month that we see are actually acutely agitated during their visit with us. And 50% have conditions that we would call that would put them at risk to become agitated. And that may be schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or maybe some variants of depression, substance intoxications, what have you. Um, but we're discharging 78% within 24 hours arrival. And I think since I made this slide, I think I'm up over 80,000 now. So it's, uh, it just keeps going on and on. But agitation, even though we said there's like maybe 7 million episodes in the United States each year, but when's the last time you saw a telethon against agitation? Where's the fun run, you know? People aren't doing things like that. Um, but there's a big, huge cost to agitation. Uh, there's a real nice study from Michael Allen and Glenn Courier from about 12 years ago where they said that uh, the average ER or psych ED has eight patient to staff assaults per facility per year. And some places that are a lot busier, maybe kind of places like where I work, have more than 25 patient assaults to staff per year that end up in serious injury. These aren't just somebody going like, hey, and taking a swing and missing the person, but actually a very bad injury, an assault that ends in a bad injury um, that's serious enough to miss work. That's the only ones that we're counting. And, and we've seen this, unfortunately, where I work, where sometimes people would be involved with an agitated individual and get hurt so badly, they're like, that's it, I'm done. I'm not working in this kind of work anymore. And that's terrible because you know, we, we need everybody that we can who's good, who works in this line of work. And, and we don't want to scare people away or, or have people leave for good. But so uh, some of the things that when we've been working on our agitation research and said, like, you know, we'd really like to reduce using coercive measures. We don't want to have restraints. We, we, we would like to do things where we're working collaboratively with patients rather than saying, shut up, sit down, I'm the doctor, you're the patient, which tends not to work that well, believe it or not. Um, but we, we, our staff would say, well, if we're not going to be restraining these patients and, and pumping them full of sedatives, then they're going to be very dangerous and they're going to be attacking us and they're hurting us and these assaults are going to go up. But what we found in our research is that two-thirds of staff injuries during uh, uh, agitated patients is when the staff are all kind of tackling the person, doing what they call containment, trying to take somebody down. That's when the injuries happen. That's when the assaults happen. So it would kind of follow that if you figured out a way not have to get to that point, you'd have less assaults and less injuries. So let's see if indeed that's the deal. Um, restraints themselves are a bad thing. Uh, we were talking with some folks earlier today that, that uh, one of the things that we like to do with working with our new staff is when we're doing management of assaultive behavior training is we'll actually put them into restraints, into a restraint room, and turn off the light and leave the room and have them be in there for 10 minutes. And it's amazing because if you've ever actually been where you have wrists, ankles, your belly restrained, and you're in a room just lying there and you can't move and your, your, your mobility and your freedom is gone, people start to really go, wow, this is not fun. It's not something that I'd want to do. Uh, and I don't think I want to do this to our patients. And that's great. That's a great outcome. Well, we did have one guy who said, you know, with candles and wine and music. And, but, uh, but anyway, so there's even still people, even to this day, who are dying in restraints. And, and so Joint Commission, CMS, other groups that do surveys um, are you know, really looking into it. And, and they uh, are always hoping that different facilities would be reducing their use of restraint and seclusions. So the surveys are, want to do it. It's not good for patients. It's not good for the staff either. People feel bad about putting people in restraints. So how can we work with agitated individuals and avoid restraints and find alternatives where it's a, where it's a nice outcome for everybody? Um, restraints actually even cost a lot of money to an institution. There's a good study that came out from the, uh, the federal government where they said a single episode of restraints costs an institution $300, $350 on top of everything else that the, is going on in the hospital for that individual at the time. Uh, 25 different activities uh, are involved in one hour restraint, 12 hours of staff time, and as I said before, a high staff turnover, high liability costs. Insurance companies actually even look at an organization's restraint and seclusion numbers when they do their underwriting policy. So it's not just happening inside your department or inside your hospital or something like that. People are looking at these things, whether it be federal regulators or insurance companies or whoever. And I've seen um, 
hospitals that have reduced their restraint use where their workman's comp and their other liability insurance has gone way, way down. Uh, it's just something else to know. So on top of all those things and with those regulators saying let's do less restraints, let's do less seclusion, humanitarian concerns would say the same thing. And, and patient rights groups have said, hey, why are we putting so many people in restraints? It's still the default treatment, unfortunately, at the vast majority of medical ERs in the United States, and I know that it doesn't happen here, which you guys are way ahead of the curve. The people I've met today have been just phenomenal along those lines. But a lot of places, if you are agitated, you come into the emergency department, they're going to just say security, and they're going to grab the person, and they're going to tie them down, and they're going to put them in a stretcher, and they're going to pull their pants down, and they're going to shoot them up with really painful medications, and they're going to knock them unconscious for 12, 16, 24 hours, and say it's the next shift's problem when they wake up. And that's called restrain and sedate, and it's been the kind of status quo for many, many years. And a lot of places have made innovative changes to kind of address that this isn't the best way to do things. Although, but I think still, if you look at most hospitals, it's what they do. Um, so a lot of people are saying, okay, we, we, we don't want to put people in restraints. We understand that's a bad thing, we, but what are we going to do? We have agitated individuals come in. How can we change this? So that's kind of where, uh, where we came in. Um, Basically, uh, there is a great quote here from the Institute of Medicine that said, the status quo is not acceptable, cannot be tolerated any longer. It's simply not acceptable for patients to be harmed by the same healthcare system that's supposed to be offering healing and comfort. That's a really interesting way to look at it. If somebody's coming to us for help, why are we tying them down and putting them in restraints? And the concept of restraints is like taking away freedom of movement. And that's something we wouldn't want to do to anybody if we could. So people have made agitation guidelines before. The unfortunate thing about them is they've mostly been focused not on how do you avoid restraints or how do you work with people who have agitation, but once you've tied them down, what medication do you give them? Uh, one of the first uh, guidelines series that kind of looked at it a little different way was, was also from the American Association of Emergency Psychiatry. That was in 2005. Two interesting points about the, what they said the priority was for treating folks with agitation. Uh, obviously, control of aggressive behavior emerged as the highest priority, but, and this is something that was kind of even revolutionary at the time, just, just nine years ago, preserving a relationship with patients became a top, top priority in the long term. You know, I think a lot of times, and I've heard this from doctors that I've worked with before, they say like, well, you know, if we put somebody in restraints and give them some shots, they don't remember anything that's going on anyway. And au contraire, what we've actually found is that people who've had an agitation episode remember every single moment of it, like it clear as a bell. Uh, so, and it's gonna, it's gonna color their relationship with doctors, with mental health professionals from that point on. If they think that if I'm in, in a crisis and I need help, and the first thing that's going to happen is I'm tackled and, and given these really painful, unpleasant medications. Uh, why should I trust anybody? Why should I take my meds? Uh, it's better for me to just stay away from those folks because that's what they think of me. Um, so the patient preference is important. Working together with people, those are all important. So, so that was started to be, there was a seed of that from the uh, agitation guidelines in 2005. But we still felt that things were, were not really uh, complete and we did not have really good overall guidelines. So uh, when I was president of the American Association of Emergency Psychiatry in 2010, we decided to start a project called Project Beta. And what we wanted to do was develop new guidelines that were not only effective but safety-minded. And this was something different, actually considering what's the best interest of the patient. What would, if I was the person who was agitated, would I want to have happen to me? And let's think about people's rights and let's think about their long-term prospects in mental health treatment and, and how things work for them in the long haul, not just let's solve this problem for you know, in the next few minutes. Let's kind of work together so that whatever we do now is going to have an effect for perhaps the rest of their life. We were lucky enough to get, actually it was over, over 40 uh, people involved working on the project to create these guidelines. Uh, emergency psychiatrists, but also emergency medicine docs, patient advocates, uh, mental health professionals, hospital administrators. We had patients, peers that were involved, and even a patient uh, rights attorney that got involved. And actually, I think Dr. Schultz, you, you helped us out with uh, doing a 
peer, uh, uh, review of, of some of the, the articles for us. Yeah. So beta stood for best practices in the evaluation and treatment of agitation. And also it was like, like an idea you often hear about beta testing for new software, things like that. It was kind of like, let's do it. maybe it's time to have a beta uh, approach to uh, uh, agitation. So it was a nice way to kind of combine those concepts. So what we do in working with people with agitation, we follow um, what I used to call the six goals of emergency psychiatric care until a few months ago I saw somebody putting them up as his six goals of emergency psychiatric care. So now they're Zeller's six goals of emergency psychiatric care. And that's basically uh, these six concepts. This is when the, those of us who work in emergency psychiatry, these are the six things we really want to see happen when somebody comes to us. The very first thing is we want to exclude medical etiologies of symptoms. And we want to make sure, sure somebody's medically stable. Something along the lines of 20% or higher of what seems like psychiatric emergencies are actually either medical emergencies or there's a medical comorbidity going on. So when somebody comes to us and they're like acutely agitated, something along those lines, we want to make sure that they're healthy, they're safe, and that we can proceed with our psychiatric mental health care without having to worry that their, uh, their blood sugar is 500 or, or that their, their, their blood pressure is way off the wall or, or they're actually having a intracranial bleed, not a psychiatric emergency. We want to be able to rule, rule those things out. So we consider that as a very, very important part and I'll, I'll say how that uh, relates to the beta project in, in a minute. Then we want to rapidly stabilize the acute crisis. When somebody is in agitation, for example, it's easy to say, oh, look at that person, they're being a jerk, they're saying mean things, they're combative, what a bad person they are, whatever treatment they get is, they've got it coming, right? Uh, but, you know, most of these are really, really nice people who have a really bad illness. And it's the illness that's making things happen. It's the illness that's, that's, that's making them act the way that they're doing. And if you think of it in a different way, rather than kind of behaving badly, if you will, Think of it as, this is a psychiatric version of the worst headache you've ever had in your life. You're just like in so much pain in a psychiatric way that you have no other way to respond to it but being agitated or combative. And if you think of it as being, wow, wow, what a, what a horrible, horrible situation of pain. If you were in that kind of pain, if you had, imagine the worst headache you ever had. Did you want to say, oh, I'll, get it, I'll take care of it in a few hours? Or are you like, I want to, I, this just got to go right away. Let's fix it right away. My idea is like this. Let's get people better like that. Like in every James Bond movie, for some reason, they hand him a shaken, not stirred martini. He takes a sip and he goes, oh, no, poison. Boom. He hits the ground. We don't have that med yet in our hospital. But I'd like to stabilize acute crises that quickly where it's just like James Bond, where it's just a few seconds and we take away that horrible psychiatric pain that's causing agitation. And we want to do so in such a way where we're not being coercive. We don't want to do that. Like I said before, I'm the doctor, you're the patient. Do what I say, sit down and shut up. Doesn't work that well. Treat in the least restrictive setting. That means restraints are very restrictive. Being in a locked hospital unit is very restrictive. What would be nice is to get people to a situation where they're free to come and go as they please, maybe very comfortable sitting, watching their favorite show on TV and relaxed and wouldn't that be nice as opposed to being in restraints or being locked in the hospital so we want to help people to get out of a restrictive setting as quickly as possible and in doing so we're going to form a therapeutic alliance where once again instead of i'm the doctor you're the patient we're going to work together let's help you to get better and we'll get you um, out of here and, and in really good shape as quickly as possible and one of the best things that we can do then is once we have helped somebody to stabilize is to make sure that we've got an appropriate disposition for them and an aftercare plan with the idea that they're not going to get agitated again. They're not going to have to end up coming to the hospital again. One of my goals in emergency psychiatry has always been to put myself out of work. And it would be fine. I'd get a job driving a truck or something. It would be really fun. Uh, but it would be great if people didn't have psychiatric emergencies anymore and maybe if we really worked well to establish a really solid grounding therapeutic alliance, good outpatient follow-up that people won't end up having to come back and wouldn't that be a great situation. So based on those goals, uh, we ended up putting together five work groups. Uh, there were medical evaluation and triage, psychiatric evaluation, 
verbal de-escalation, which is the most important thing, and that's about finding ways to help a person who's agitated calm down without using coercive measures, without having to immediately push down and, and, and medicate, but rather use techniques that can help people to relax. Uh, we do still have a role for psychopharmacology in agitation. We had a whole work group on that. And then finally, a group on uh, hopingly uh, to avoid seclusion and restraint, and then if you do use it, what's the proper way to follow that? So we published it uh, in the February 2012 issue of, uh, of an emergency medicine journal, the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Um, what's really neat is that they're the six most downloaded articles in the history of the journal at this point, and we know of hundreds of hospitals worldwide that have implemented our beta guidelines and have had some just tremendous results in lowering the number of use of restraints, but also numbers of assaults, injuries, lowering the numbers of the, the cost of their workman's comp program even. Um, and we published it in this particular journal because one, it was an emergency medicine journal and we wanted, where do they see most agitation in the ERs? Uh, so we wanted to make sure that it got out to that population. We also made it in this journal because they're an open access journal, so it's free to download and share to everybody, and we didn't want it to be one of those deals where you find an article and it says, you can have it for 24 hours for 35 bucks. And I was like, well, then I guess I can't have it. Um, so we wanted these to be free for everybody, and so it's been nice. I think the D, I just heard this last week, the de-escalation article, which is kind of the centerpiece of the Bajor project, has been downloaded over 30,000 times, which is pretty neat. So what are the beta recommendations and guidelines? Well, as I said, it's a behavioral emergency agitation. It requires an immediate intervention. But the prefer preferred intervention is what we call verbal de-escalation. Medication is often very important and can help, uh, and it often can be part of verbal de-escalation. They go hand in hand. You can be working with somebody and say, hey, things aren't going well right now. I'm going to help you be safe and get you away from this, this unpleasant place, and let's go somewhere and we're going to get you some medicine. You'll be able to relax. That, that's a good de-escalation. Uh, but as we said before, as we went through the goals, unless signs and symptoms dictate uh, that there's an emergency medical problem, let's take care of that first. And then if they get to make sure that a patient's medically stable, then make sure de-escalation is the most important thing and it takes precedence over everything else. So de-escalation, and the goal is to help people regain control. And that's something when we've spoken to people who've had agitation that we hear all the time. It, it, tell us about what it felt like. And they say, I felt like I, I couldn't control myself. I was out of control. I'd lost control. And so it's not so much that we want to be forcible or coerce somebody. We want to help them together to regain self-control so that they, they, they can they do things as they want to. And they don't feel like they're out of control. Um, so when we're engaging people, we use de-escalation, and that's how we avoid seclusion and restraints. This is a kind of a little schematic of how the, the, uh, the five beta articles work together. And as you can see, everything kind of revolves around de-escalation. And only uh, if, if everything else doesn't work do we have to go to seclusion and restraint, and hopefully we can avoid that. So verbal de-escalation. The one thing when we were first coming out with the beta, and I would talk to groups of emergency medicine doctors, and they would say, well, I'm a very busy emergency medicine doc, and you know, I don't have time to do this de-escalation stuff you're talking about, Dr. Zeller, and it's much easier for me to just write an order for a person to get some shots of Haldol, and, uh, and then I move on to the next patient, and that, that makes much more sense in, in uh, my busy modern emergency department. Um, but then I said, well, you know, here's the thing. You've got somebody... Um, who you didn't want to do de-escalation on. So then you summon the, the code team for your assault code team or something like that. And it takes all the time for them to come down. And then they engage the patient. And then finally there's a whole thing where there's a struggle and they take the person down. And then maybe they tie them down to a gurney and they move them over to another room and they take them out of the gurney and put them into a bed. And then somebody else goes and starts drawing up the medication, and they get the medication, they bring it back, and then the group has to come and hold the patient down and maybe pull their pants down so they give them shots in a naked hip. And finally, okay, you've done all that. What's that, 20, 30 minutes sometimes? Good de-escalation you can do in two minutes, three minutes. Doesn't that make a lot more sense than 30 minutes? And when you explain it like that, suddenly it's like, well, I guess maybe I do have two minutes to try some de-escalation. We've basically said in the beta, if you've tried de-escalation for up to five minutes and you don't see you're getting anywhere, 
okay, then move along to your more traditional methods, but it always is worth trying. Even in really, really agitated patients, you'd be surprised. I've had people who come in screaming and yelling that will still answer questions. They'll be like, rah, 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 rah. And I'll say like, well, what medication were you like? Rah, 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 Risperdal, you know? And, <laughs> and it, it works, it's amazing. If we can avoid those containment, we can result in less injuries to both staff members and patients, and patients are gonna be more trustful and want to work together with us, as I said, if we're not forcing things on them, if we're not forcing medications, if we're not forcibly restraining them. And then if you're in a situation like a lot of ERs are around the country where they've got to try to transfer somebody out to a psychiatric hospital or another place for their evaluation, well, what's gonna happen if you give them uh, forcible medications and have them in restraints and knock them unconscious? You call the other hospital and they say, what are they doing now? Well, they're in restraints and they're sleeping. Call us back when they're awake and they're not in restraints. And so that leads to people being stuck in restraints or stuck in hospitals for a long time and not getting psychiatric care that they need. So avoiding the whole restraint and, and course of medications can have benefits for the medical center as well. Here's a good example of that. This is a good study from Tony Weiss and Great Chang uh, out of Massachusetts General a couple years back where they found that if you put a psychiatric patient into restraints in the emergency department, they're going to end up staying there an extra 4.2 hours than if you hadn't used restraints. I mean, that's a long time for an ED. 4.2 hours, they maybe could have gotten another eight to 10 patients into that same bed and gotten treatment during that time. That's a lot of people then who are leaving without being seen, who aren't getting the care they need. They're getting bad care because everybody's rushing. Wouldn't it be nice just to avoid the restraints and then you wouldn't have had that issue. Patients themselves know that being restrained costs a lot, both financial, physical, mentally. Here's what one patient said. Being restrained costs a lot. I was abused before I was in psychiatric care. Being restrained made me feel the same way, except staff were supposed to help me, right? It made me worse and it took away my self-esteem. How is that supposed to make me feel better? I don't get it. Wouldn't it have been cheaper if staff had just listened to me? And that's one of the things we find the most when we talk to patients who've actually been in restraints, saying, all I wanted to do, I, I was just thirsty, or I wanted something to eat, or I wanted somebody to know that I was bleeding out of my ankle, or something. but nobody would listen to me. They just kept saying, you sit down and shut up. And sometimes if just listening is such an easy part of de-escalation and is so uh, often avoided. So de-escalation, I could do a whole afternoon with you on how to do it and what's the best thing about it. And we obviously only have a limited amount of time here. I will give you some very, very quick ideas about de-escalation. If there's any main overarching, overriding philosophy of agitation, it is if somebody is agitated in front of you, don't be agitated back to them. Simple, right? Everybody forgets it. Because it, what instead happens is somebody starts threatening you and calling you names, and staff get what I call the oh yeah response. Oh yeah? What'd you say about my mother? You know, and it uh, doesn't help. Instead, what you can do is be the calmest person possible in response. Somebody is being agitated to you, and you should be non-provocative in response. You're calm soft-spoken, and in fact, there's even like this ideal way of looking at being somebody. So you bend your knees a little bit, your arms are at your sides so that you can see you're not clenching your fists or holding weapons. You're like, hey, I'm over-exaggerating here. <laughs> hey, how's it going? How, how's everything? We're here to help you. We're here, we're here to help, not to hurt. You're safe here. It's things like that. What, what can we do? What, what do you need? How can we help? Um, personal space is big. Realize that most people who are agitated are usually very paranoid, or they're having racing thoughts, or they're hearing voices in their head. They're very confused to an extent. They don't know what's going on. They like things to be explained to them, and they also like to know that they're safe, and that can be from space. Give people a couple arms length, maybe a couple legs length of space, so that they know that, uh, otherwise, see, when you're really paranoid and your thoughts are racing, you start getting down to this real brainstem way of thinking like, I've got to protect myself. I've got to either fight or flight. I'm gonna, I'm gonna either, punch somebody or I'm going to run out of here. So if you give them a little bit of space, that makes them know that you're not about to corner them in. Hear that like caged animal or somebody in a, backed into a corner, how frightening and scary that is and people feel they need to defend themselves. Well, what do you know? If you have somebody who's agitated, you put them in that situation, it's going to make things worse. Give them some space. And then the other thing is what we say, offer a line of egress, which means 
make sure they can see they have an exit. You may not want them to run for that exit, but something about them in the back of their head where they can see, like I can see there's that door there. If I really need to, I can make a run for it right now and get out. Just seeing that is more relaxing. Now you definitely don't want them to make a run for that door, but somehow knowing that they have a way out helps people to regain control, helps them to calm. And basing that idea is how does that apply? I've seen staff where they'll say, oh look, He's backing into the corner. Let's surround him, and that will help him to calm down. That doesn't really work. You're crowding in, and the person doesn't have that line of egress. Then when you do uh, talk to somebody, usually if you've got a group, have one person be the identified communicator. Talk in short, simple phrases. Remember, a person's having usually racing paranoid thoughts, and it's difficult for them to understand, so it's easy to repeat yourself. Say things like, you're safe, we're here to help. No harm will come to you, and just one person. So I've also seen other things where there's a group talking, and there'll be like five people talking at once, and that's confusing in any situation. One person who's kind of leading everything. So be concise, as I said. Use short phrases. Repeat yourself. Repeat yourself. Ask what people want. Sometimes it's as simple as they're thirsty. They're hungry. They want to sit down. They want to get away from that person over there who's been strange to them or has been touching them or something like that. Maybe it's as simple as that. And, and just finding ways to help people to relax, looking at ways that you can collaboratively help them to regain control. If all those things don't work, you lay down the law, you, you still offer choices. One of the things about people regaining control, having choices helps you to regain control. If you're able to decide on yourself, I can do this or that, that makes you feel like you've got some control over the situation. That's part of regaining control yourself. So give people choices, like you can come with us to this room here and it's gonna be safer and quieter and, and you, you, you'll enjoy it. Um, don't argue with them, don't up the ante. You may get to a point where you agree to disagree and that's where if hopefully you've already solved everything by this point, but only at that point would you go to the restraints. And then if you do have to go to where you do a takedown or restraints, the one thing that's really important is what we call debriefing. And that is, we do this every time at our psych ED. Um, if we ever put somebody into restraints, the staff all gets together afterward and said, okay, what did we just do? Did we do everything right? How could we have avoided putting the person in restraints? Was it possible? Maybe this was just a situation where we couldn't have done better. But let's all figure out how we can make sure that we did everything the best we could, and if not, let's not do it that way again. Then we go, and once our, our patient is doing better, we go and talk to them. Hey, we're really sorry this had to happen. We didn't want this to happen. How can we work together so this doesn't happen again? Make sure they know it's safe and that this is an unusual situation and we're gonna work together so it doesn't happen. And then there's a third debriefing that people often don't think about, and that is, there's a good study that showed something like 92% of people who had been in a psychiatric inpatient ward had witnessed a takedown, and it really frightened them. And it made them think that they were in jeopardy in their own hospitalization. So we like to go around and talk to other patients in the milieu and say, hey, I know what you just saw. It's not the way that we like to do things here. You're safe, and if, there, if you want to talk about things, let's, let's talk about it now and make sure that you know this is a safe place. And so those are all important parts of de-escalation. So once we have gone beyond the uh, de-escalation concept and we talk about the kind of pharmacological approaches, what's our goals there? Well, obviously, we want to reduce the dangerous behaviors. We want to reduce distress. We want to take away that, that worst headache in the world, what we'd call psychiatric anguish, if you will. Uh, we want to do it in such a way where there's as few side effects as possible. And here's something that's kind of different way to look at it than it had been in the past. Um, the whole restraint and sedate idea was let's knock these people as unconscious as possible and we'll worry about them tomorrow or the next shift we'll worry about them. We don't like that idea. What we like instead is let's calm people down. Let's help them to regain control and make people tranquil, not tranquilized, if you will. Uh, so we don't want them to be unconscious. Let's, let's get them mellow. Let's, let's chill them out, if you will. Let's do it in such a way where we don't need to use physical restraints. We're creating a therapeutic alliance in such a way where people can feel like they're getting better without coercive, horrible treatments so that maybe they won't get agitated again in the future. Working in emergency psychiatry, I realize that I'm often the first psychiatrist that a person may ever come in contact with, and that's an important role. So if I screw that up and I'm a guy who just says, you know, 
let's tie them down and give them a shot, maybe they're going to think that's the way all psychiatrists are. Maybe all people in mental health are like that. And maybe then, why should I take medications? Those, those evil people are the ones who want me to take the medications. We realize that we have to do things in such a way where we're, we're not being coercive and we have a therapeutic license, uh, alliance because we want to help these people as much as possible to have a, a good life and really avoid some of the bad outcomes from fearing or, or not wanting to work together with, with mental health. So the general medication recommendations, one of the most important things, and we hear this a lot, I keep hearing this a lot all around the country. Sometimes people say when you give somebody who's agitated a medication that's chemically restraining them, and you can definitely chemically restrain somebody, but we don't believe in that. In fact, my hospital has clearly said that we do not chemically restrain individuals. Why not? The definition, this, this is from CMS's definition and Joint Commission as well. Definition of chemical restraint is giving somebody a medication that is not indicated for their condition solely to restrict their freedom of movement. That sounds like a pretty horrible thing. Why would I want to give anybody something like that? And in fact, if you do give somebody a chemical restraint and call it that, you have to do the same kind of uh, documentation and observation that you do with physical restraints. So you don't want to chemically restrain somebody. So what do you do instead? You give somebody an appropriate treatment for the symptoms of agitation. There's actually four FDA-approved medications for agitation. So that's not a medication given for something it's not indicated for, and you're giving it for an appropriate dose, and you're giving it because you want to help people to regain control. You want to help people get better. You're not giving it solely to restrain their freedom of movement. So that's why we don't want to chemically restrain. We want to help people and give appropriate medications. And we want to do non-pharmacologic non approaches first, which is verbal de-escalation. Again, calm, not induce sleep. And if at all possible, remember about choices, helping people to regain control. Let's give people a choice. We'd love asking patients, what helps you when, when, when it's a tough time like this? What medication works for you? What medication would you like right now? You know, sometimes they'll say, well, lots of cocaine. You know, no, that's not coming. But you know, we can do something that might have worked for you in the past. And then because of that, most people are going to ask for meds that they can take by mouth, which is a lot better because most people don't like shots. Um, once again, there are people who come and request shots, but the average person would prefer giving something where you give them something and they swallow it, and then they're going to get better, and that's a general recommendation. Now, this is a pretty difficult slide, so I'm not going to go into it. But this is the algorithm from Project Beta for medication. It, it breaks down agitation into uh, different causes and says what medications you should use in each one. So um, I'll show you the, the website, or you can go onto PubMed and get the beta articles if you want to actually see this. Uh, so we'll skip that, but I'll go over real quickly the ones that are more salient for us today. Uh, agitation from a psychiatric illness, this would most commonly be schizophrenia or, or bipolar mania. Uh, again, oral meds are preferred. They're less coercive. You can do them and maintain a therapeutic alliance. You aren't using a needle, so you aren't trying to give somebody who's combative or, or thrashing a needle where he's like, ah, got me instead kind of thing. And, and somebody who's cooperative, it's easy to administer. We also recommended as part of the project that second generation antipsychotics are preferred both for by mouth versions and the intramuscular versions. The PO uh, that were the by mouth versions that were recommended from Project Beta were risperidone and olanzapine, uh, which are both also available in rapid dissolving forms. At, at my shop, where we see all the patients we do, we use a lot of what's called Zyprexazitis, uh, which is real easy for people to swallow and get down and um, it actually is faster than the regular Zyprexiform. You'll hear a lot of people saying that it's not, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which I don't have time to explain, but it's actually 15 minutes faster along the line than the regular Zyprexa uh, pills, capsules. If you do need to go to the IM injection, uh, we, the recommendations was for either IM Zeprazidone, which is Geodon, or IM Olanzapine, which is Zyprexa. Um, and then if the first dose didn't seem to be good enough, uh, didn't recommend giving a second dose of the same med, but I'd rather then go for uh, lorazepam or, or another benzodiazepine. So why the second generation uh, antipsychotics over the first generation antipsychotics? So the one that's still probably the most commonly given in the United States is haloperidol for agitated individuals, or haldol. Um, there's also a really commonly known cocktail that people are given 
uh, where it's Haldol and Ativan, sometimes Haldol, Ativan, Benadryl, sometimes Haldol, Ativan, Cogentin. There's even a uh, colloquial expression, give them the B-52, which is Haldol-5, Ativan-2, Benadryl-50. Or, one time I heard of the Dr. Pepper. Anybody heard of that one before? Give them the Dr. Pepper. Remember first that, for those of you old enough to remember that Dr. Pepper bottles used to say 10 to 4 on them, the times of day you should enjoy a delicious Dr. Pepper. <laughs> so 10 to 4 was Haldol 10, Cogentin 2, Ativan 4. And guess what happened when you gave that to people, IM? They were asleep for a long, long time after that. So the IM second generation antipsychotics, the IM melanzapine, IM zyprexa, actually alone replace that whole cocktail. Instead of giving all those two or three meds, you can just give the one shot. Um, and the patients actually prefer it. If you talk to people who've um, given uh, haloperidol, um, you know, they often, I have yet to meet a person who said they like the way Haldol made them feel. Whereas I've actually talked to people who've gotten the IM atypicals and they say like, hey, that wasn't so bad, you know, that's all right. Uh, the, the biggest thing is that it causes a much less risk of dystonic reactions. And a lot of ER docs didn't realize this, that because they usually happen 16 to 24 hours after they got the IM Haldol, where they'd get these horrible, horrible dystonic reactions where they'd get <laughs> like laryngospasm, really scary, or, or like an ocular gyro crisis where the eyes are rolling back in their head. I just saw one of those again the other day. Um, really bad akathisia, bad extrapyramidal symptoms, uh, torticollis. Um, just really, really scary things like medications shouldn't be causing somebody who's in an urgent, uh, very acute situation, yet they do. Uh, but then also, like I said, the dysphoria where, where people have gotten held all, they're, they're actually like complaining about it for a long time after. And the other thing, as I was saying, we give that, that Dr. Pepper, you're going to have somebody unconscious for 24 hours. And as we spoke about before, you're not going to get much of a disposition and you're not going to be able to help people if they're over sedated. Um, but going back to the dysphoria real quickly, I'll share an idea with you. Um, Berkeley, California is in my catchment area, and you may have heard of Berkeley, California. It's a, you're living in a college town here. Berkeley, California is where UC Berkeley is and where the free speech movement evolved and kind of like the home of hippies and, and what have you and, and all that. Um, so Berkeley has, has, is an in, interesting and very colorful community. Um, and there's a, there's a street called Telegraph Avenue where, let's say, a lot of our... Uh, Patients we would see on a recurrent basis in our psych ED might habituate. In fact, if I park my car in that street and open the car door, I'm certain to hear somebody go, hey, look over there, there's my doctor. You know? <laughs> Got a dollar? You know. <laughs> so one day a friend asked me out to, uh, to go to lunch in an outdoor cafe on Telegraph Avenue. And it was actually this place where there was like a little gating that went along the sidewalk. And we were sitting at an outdoor table and I was having my lunch. And some guy was walking along and saw me and reached over the gate and grabbed my collar and lifted me up out of the chair and said, you're the son of a gun who gave me a shot of Haldol. Now you're going to pay. So I used all 10 of the de-escalation commandments. Um, and unfortunately, it worked out OK. And I was able to shake his hand and walk away. But I heard his story. And it had been 18 months ago, and he had still remembered who I was and the fact that I'd been responsible for him getting a shot of Haldol. And he said that for several days afterwards, he felt like he was walking through a vat of jello. And he said, don't do that to people. And I always remember that. And so I haven't really wanted to do that to people ever since. So that, that's one of my reasons on patient preferences. But the oversedation thing is also big because if somebody's oversedated, if we're just knocking somebody unconscious to wait for the next shift, their ability to work with us together is gone. We can't ask them questions. We can't find out what their story is. If they're in pain, we don't know. We can't do a, any kind of medical evaluation. And if you're just talking for people working in the ED and you have something where you have the psych consultant coming, if you call up and say, come on, do a psych consult, where's the patient doing? He's sleeping. Call me when he's awake. So then you've got a big delays in that. You're often unable to transfer somebody until they're awake and alert. And you're basically just tying up space. You're not helping the patient. You're not helping anybody. You're not helping the system. So over sedation is something we'd like to avoid. So going back to the idea, let's help people calm down, relax, chill out, if you will, but not just knock unconscious like we did traditionally. Um, quickly, because I'm running out of time, agitation of intoxication. Um, 
This is one thing. We see lots and lots of stimulant abuse out where we are. Uh, I would imagine you probably see methamphetamine, maybe even some crack out here as well, like we do. We found that a lot of those folks uh, don't actually even need antipsychotic meds, that a lot of their psychosis and their agitation is coming because they've had this caustic substance running through their veins for four or five days, and they haven't slept. Those are people we don't mind sleeping for a few hours. I'll give them a little bit of Ativan, and they might sleep for six or seven or eight hours, and, and uh, they wake up, and boy, clear as a bell. And so we always recommend giving uh, like, uh, benzos for people as a first line of those situations. 99% of the time, those people, if they don't have an underlying psychotic illness, they'll wake up, they'll be much clearer, and they'll go like, hey, doc, thanks for all the help. I'm doing better. Sorry what I said about your mother, you know. And, but they're ready to go, and we're like, get out of here. Don't do drugs anymore, you know. <laughs> and so, um, so that's good. So we've gotten somebody better, and we've gotten them out of being in a dangerous situation where they're dangerous to some others, and they're doing better. And hopefully we can get them into then a drug program or something else where we can work with them. But what we don't have is somebody restrained and, and agitated. Or we gave them antipsychotic meds, which might cause side effects. And why, if we could just wait for detox and help them get some sleep. Um, alcohol is probably the only one that's still recommended that haloperidol would be uh, used uh, because most of the data just points to that. So do the beta recommendations work? Well, here is a California psychiatric ER, the difference in what happened from the time of implementation, uh, the six months before it was implemented till about a year after they were implemented. And initially, the seclusion restraints went down 43%, but Contrary to what all the staff believed, assaults went down 58%, as did injuries. And as I was saying before, a lot of the staff were like, this isn't going to work. We're all going to be putting ourselves in danger. But it was one of these kind of things that when staff started buying into it and believing, they really saw the benefits and really started going, hey, this will work. And then there was su suddenly competition. Who's better at verbal de-escalation? Who's better at encouraging people to take medications rather than being coercive? Uh, and it was great. And everybody, the more people started seeing it working, the more people wanted to do it. And we've seen this replicated around and around and around in many different places. So this particular spot went down to uh, averaging less than eight um, seclusions and restraints combined per 1,000 patients in their psych ER. There's about eight psych ERs in the, in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, so at the one that I work at right now, as I was saying before, we're right now using two restraints for every 1,000 patients. And all of our patients come to us directly from the field. They're coming to us straight from where they might have been screaming, running naked down the freeway. And they're brought in to us on an involuntary hold. And I think the default five years ago would have been put them in restraints. Somebody, even back in the day, they used to say, like, the person's looking at me in a bad way, and they're mute. They won't contract against harmfulness, put them in restraints. I mean, there's a lot of other ways that you can look at it, and we're actually successfully down to getting closer to zero, 0 0.002, but I'd like that to be all the way down to 000. And actually, as we continue to do that, the there was a reduction in salts of 35% over that time, too. Um, so interestingly, just this past week, Queens Medical Center in Honolulu, which is a trauma center, this is an emergency medicine center, not a dedicated psych ER just published a paper on they implemented the beta guidelines and they went from 20 restraints per month to zero. And this is like no psych personnel on board. So this is like saying, oh, maybe you can do this if you've got psych trained people or something like that. No, even this trauma center with no psychiatric personnel just published following beta, they, they went down to zero restraints, which is just terrific. And we're seeing that we found that people are using beta in Australia in India, in New Zealand, in Germany, in Austria, in Spain, Sri Lanka. I even got somebody reaching out from Iran recently, which is really interesting. I was kind of afraid to answer their email, to be honest. <laughs> um, but it, so it is possible. Um, as I said last week, uh, there was the Institute for Psychiatric Services meeting in, uh, of the American Psychiatric Association. We presented a uh, workshop called Success Stories from Project Beta, uh, where we had Representatives from seven different medical centers across the United States came up and showed every one of them had dropped way down in restraints and, con and concomitantly dropped way down in injuries, assaults, and one place dropped their, uh, their workman's comp 
insurance by 90% because they dropped their restraint and assaults so much. So it all does work. This is the actual link to the Western Journal of Emergency Medicine. Or if you just go to PubMed or, or just, go on, um, just go on Google and say Project Beta Agitation. And you, all the articles are free to download and share. And you can give to anybody you want. And we wanted them all to be free for everybody. And I think that's all I have to say. I made it exactly at